All right, I'm going to go ahead and get things started here. Um, this is re being recorded and will be posted up to the um, Smithsonian um, Marine Ecosystem Exhibit uh, YouTube a little later, hopefully within the next week. Um, but today we're starting our, um, our third, our third um, Marine Science in the Morning uh, webinar. Um, and today's guest is uh, Dr. Judy Winston. She is uh, currently a research associate with uh, the Marine Station here. Um, she came to us after being a curator at the Museum of Virginia Museum of Natural History. Um, but she's had a long association with the Smithsonian uh, Natural Museum, National Museum of Natural History and the Smithsonian Marine Station. She was one of the first postdocs at NMNH and uh, did her work here at SMS. Um, she got her PhD at the University of Chicago in evolutionary biology, and she is one of the um, few um, Bryozoan experts on the entire planet. So I'm anxious to hear. Um, she's good, but she is gonna be talking to us today about Darwin. Darwin Day or Darwin's birthday is on the 12th, so coming up here shortly. So this is an appropriate um, presentation. Um, uh, as far as questions, you will be able to um, put questions into the Q&A. Uh, Dr. Paul is here and she will help us manage the questions as they come in. We will probably catalog the questions and offer them up to Judy after she's finished so that uh, she can answer them directly. Um, and I guess without, uh, I think that's uh, about all the housekeeping I could do. So here's Dr. Winston. Um, Judy, if you wanna go ahead and share your screen, we can get started. Okay. Um... My, my voice is not very good, but I'm looking forward to talking about Darwin and the Galapagos. Darwin <clears throat> was born on the same day as Abraham Lincoln, on February 12th in 1809. Um, he's the most famous biologist and for that reason, and because so much of biology is based on what he found, we celebrate his birthday. Now, usually this would be done with a cake, but unfortunately we are doing this by Zoom, so we cannot have Darwin's 214th birthday cake today, but instead we'll have a presentation on his trip to the Galapagos and a little bit on a trip I made to the Galapagos to look at the marine life, which is a different story than the life on land. So to get going, <clears throat> Darwin was only 22 when he was invited to go as the naturalist on the Beagle. <clears throat> <clears throat> now, why he was picked, no one knows exactly, but he had a, apparently a really easy going disposition. And in the five year trip, one of the sailors said, nobody ever picked a fight with him. He was an easy going guy. He got along with everybody, including Captain Fitzroy, who was a very difficult guy. This is the beagle. <clears throat> and as you can see, it's pretty small. And that arrow shows you where Darwin had to set up all his experiments and collections and packing the collections at the end of this chart table. Not very big. So that's probably one reason they took a young man who couldn't complain too much about the situation of housing on the Beagle. And this is the route of the voyage. 
Now, Darwin was excited to go, partly because he'd been going to take a trip to Tenerife, but he finally got on as far as the Canary Islands, where he saw tropical things for the first time. And he was really excited, started keeping a journal about it. He saw virgin forest geology. He had actually learned geology tutored by Adam Sedgwick, a ge famous geologist, before the voyage started. And so he was able to um, start right away looking at the geology in first the Canary Islands and then in South America. And he also got into the biology. And it's possible that he got a disease called Chagas disease there, although that's not certain. So eventually they came around to the archipelago of the Galapagos. And Galapagos means tortoise in Spanish. And they actually only stopped at four of the islands but they got to see the amazing and unique wildlife there. And they, Darwin especially, noted that they were volcanic islands. This is, this is the cone of a volcano. The newer volcanoes still erupt from time to time. This is another volcanic cone. And um, here, we have some ash plants. This is another view showing you that it looks more like the moon than any terrestrial habitat that Darwin would have been familiar with. Every kind of lava, hello larva, these ash covered slopes and big larva tubes that the tourists now visit, big enough to walk through, probably big enough to take a truck through some of them. And of course, he was struck by the unusual vegetation. Um, everything had spines or thorns. These are acacia trees. The uh, cactuses that we see, prickly pear cactuses we see in Florida. There's a, one in the Galapagos that grows into a huge tree. And of course, there are many other cactuses, the larva cactuses, as well as the ash plants are some of the first forms that can settle after a volcanic eruption. And <coughs> he saw <coughs> the giant tortoises, and of course was struck by those. And if you look here, go back and look. Um, that's actually the last of his kind, the Abington tortoise, Lonesome George. I should go back and see if I can get it so you can see him. Um, he died about 2012. Then there were land iguanas <clears throat> and marine iguanas, which are big. Um, they get even bigger than the introduced ones we have in South Florida. And they're the only really marine lizard. They eat, they go underwater and they graze on vegetation underwater. And of course we saw Darwin's finches, he didn't realize, unfortunately, that he needed to label which island that some of his bird collections came from. So he didn't do that much with Darwin's finches himself. This is a summary of what he found in the Galapagos. And he also brought back huge collections. Did pretty well to get them all back. And 
<coughs> as soon as he got back, he started working on writing up the journal of his research and travels in Winnebago. And also when he got back home, he decided it was time to get married. And he married Emma Darwin, who was his, actually his cousin on the Wedgwood side. She was a first cousin, which they say could lead to inbreeding effects. But as far as I can see, the Darwins did pretty well for their time period when so many children died young. They had 10 children. They managed to raise eight of them. And mostly thank to the incredible work ethic of, of Emma Darwin, who managed the house, took care of the children. And here you see Down House, where they lived most of their um, lives. The big house. She took care of the children. She took care of Darwin. She even had her own recipe book, which some people have managed to compile the recipes. And I'll tell you, there were a lot of bland diets because Darwin had worse health and it got worse over the course of his life. So that he was pretty much an invalid a lot of the time. And Mrs. Darwin nursed him and made sure that the children didn't bother him and that he could keep working on all his different projects. Because Darwin came back and he had some idea about transmutation which was not just his idea. It was an idea kind of floating around at the time that animals and plants had changed over time and that this was possible. But Darwin in the Victorian era with a religious life and it being an easygoing kind of timid guy was not going to say that himself until he had a lot of proof. So as you can see, he had a nice place to live. He had a wonderful study. He had a sand walk where he liked to walk, take a mile walk and think about what he was doing. And he studied all kinds of things while he was getting his courage up. He studied barnacles. He studied plants. He raised plants. He got into pigeon fancying and looked at the varieties of pigeons and he wrote about them. But to get back to the Galapagos, his big accomplishment geologically there was that he figured out oceanic volcano formation and how the Galapagos were a series of volcanoes. But the volcanoes would pop up under the sea. They would eventually become islands and get older and older away from the center. And of course, he didn't really know about tectonic plate moves, but he basically got it right. And that was his geological accomplishment. And of course, his biggest accomplishment was biological. And in spite of the fact that we'd know him, even if he'd only worked on barnacles, so much of biology, biology depends on what we've learned since and what he started when he finally published in 1859 his Origin of Species by Natural Selection. And that's the process where animals that are better adapted to their environment tend to survive. And in this picture, it's a dark environment. The dark little mouse-like things are less likely to be seen by the hawks. Should it change to a desert, it would probably be the light ones. And just to show you survival, not of the fittest, the Victorians got that wrong from Darwin. It's not the fittest as far as the best fighter. It's the best reproducer, the 
person who gets their genes into the gene pool or an animal whose genes stay in the gene pool the longest have the most effect. And if you look here, you can see that Darwin up to this point has about 100 descendants. So he did not do too bad, but we all become extinct eventually. And what he, he really noticed in birds were the mockingbirds. There were four species of mockingbirds. One was the common one, and then there were three others from different islands. And he didn't mess up. Well, I won't say he messed up the labels, but on the benches, he didn't write down which island they were from, and that took a long time to be straightened out with the help of a friend at the British Museum. But meanwhile, he did point out the variation in the mockingbirds on the different islands. And that led to a whole lot of work on the genetics of Galapagos animals and how evolution is happening there, happening fast in some cases, happening more slowly if you're a giant tortoise and can live 200 years. Um, he noticed the difference between the long and saddleback tortoises and the roundback tortoises. But again, he was working before people knew about genetics. That work hadn't been done way before they do, knew about DNA, molecular study. Now people are doing both ecological and molecular studies and have made lots of progress in understanding exactly how natural selection works and how fast it affects animals, especially when something changes, like when there's a really nino, there's a drought, and then the birds that eat a certain kind of seeds can't survive. Another kind of climate change, and it's the ones that can all eat the biggest seeds that do the best. Um, it's ongoing. And he grants for people who study this for many years, but there are people continuing to this day and one of the long lasting effects of his travels um, was the establishment of the Charles Darwin Research Station. And they have a tortoise nursery, nursery where they grow the giant tortoises. But the reason I went there, and I want to show you a little bit about the marine life there. I went with a man named Cleveland Hickman, a, a retired professor from William and Lee University in Virginia. And he has been involved with the Galapagos Conservancy and done research there and taken students there a long time and published this field guide, or ongoing series of field guides to the marine life of the Galapagos. And the marine life is a very different situation. The land animals that got to the Galapagos had to get there by a filter. They had to get there by sea from the nearest mainland. And this wasn't, this meant that um, they might have been blown by storms. Turtles, they say, can float pretty well. There are, there's rafting. But when you look at the marine animals, you've got currents coming from every direction. So while the pathway for land life is very restricted, and marine animals can come from almost any part of the world from the currents. So you can get them from the Indo-Pacific. You can get them through the Panama currents, the um, Cocos Arch. You can get them through the Humboldt current. So studying the marine life there, it's huge diversity and it's diversity not from just one direction. And we took a trip. There you can see a sea lion, but we took a trip from Puerto Aora as far as Darwin's Arch, which sad to say is no longer an arch. It fell in not too long ago. And we collected everything we could. And I want you to see that although you can get tropical fish and corals, 
the bottom of these huge boulders. It's not like the typical coral reef, even up in the north where you do get the reef corals. And again, you can see, see what it's like there. The diving is difficult. The water is cold, maybe 15 degrees centigrade. And um, most of the diving we did, except in sheltered harbors, was drift diving. So you start in one place and you come up in another, if you're lucky. We rescued a woman from a tourist cruise who actually had a, one of the dive um, balloons that those tubes that you carry with you, which is a good thing because she was well on her way out into the Pacific. So it was, it was difficult diving, but we found wonderful things. Um, this just gives you a sample of some of the vertebrates there, different kinds of dolphins, including the bottlenose dolphins. We dived with hundreds of hammerhead sharks up around Darwin's Arch. They paid absolutely no attention to us because it was their mating season and they were interested only in each other. We saw sea turtles underwater. We saw all kinds of fish. And of course, people like me stick their heads right down to the rocks and look for the animals, the colonial animals that are attached to the bottom. So here on this rock, you see sponges, tunicates, and these little patches here are probably biosomes. But again, um, corals include the ahermatypic corals, the ones that don't form reefs. And what I'll point out in these next slides is that they can come from everywhere. This, they can be endemic, like this coral, or they can be cosmopolitan, like that coral. There are sea anemones, there are black corals. Um, here you have a Gorgonian, which is endemic, and then you have a hydroid that is cosmopolitan. Here we have a biozoan, <clears throat> which is on an old beer bottle. Here you can see the green glass. It's a cosmopolitan species, but the one next to it is endemic to the Galapagos. Sorry, I keep doing that. Here is a species of biozone from the Eastern Pacific. And here's another that's cosmopolitan. Here is one from the Eastern Pacific. And then of course there were many echinoderms. And although this is about six inches across, things in the Pacific get big compared to the Caribbean and Atlantic that we're familiar with around here. There are brittle stones, sea cucumbers, barnacles. These barnacles are endemic. These lobsters have only recently arrived in the Galapagos. They are Indo-Pacific, so they came in, in that Cromwell current, most likely. There's a slipper lobster, which is endemic, and then there are the Sally Lightfoot crab, crabs that are in the Eastern Pacific and the Atlantic. Anyway, that is about all I have to say, except I wanna wish Charles Darwin, happy 214th birthday, and the same to Abraham Lincoln, his astrological twin. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Judy. Um... We don't have any questions currently active in the chat or in the Q&A if anybody has anything they'd like to ask at this point. 
about Darwin or the Galapagos, you can do that. Well, if nothing else, then I'd just like to remind everybody that uh, this is an ongoing series and the next uh, webinar is on February 22nd, uh, two weeks from today again at 9 a.m. And we are gonna have Dr. Connor McDonald from the Florida Oceanographic Society. He's gonna be discussing uh, seagrasses, their importance, decline, and opportunities for restoration. Um, so that's what we, oh, there is a question that popped up. Um, okay, so Samuel Seamus is, is asking, or he says the book that you displayed said that Charles Darwin, it was, the author was Charles Darwin Esquire, and he's asking if he was a lawyer. No, um, he was actually supposed to have been a clergyman. I think in those days, it was just a term for a gentleman. Oh, I'm going to adopt that, I think. That will be called Branson Esquire. Okay. <laughs> All right. Anything else? Anybody? Okay, well, thank you, Judy. I appreciate that. Um, and I'm looking forward. We can still get a cake for next week, I think. Or the, the 12th, what day is that? Oh, that's Sunday, so... No, that'll be Super Bowl Sunday too, won't it? Yep. All right. Yeah, it will. So but we can have cake. All right. All right. Thanks, everybody. Uh, we'll see you in two weeks.